It's 12 o'clock now. Um, I'm Michael Kerman with Leading Edge Seminars in Toronto, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this virtual lunch together with Ron Siegel. I really appreciate you taking the time for joining us on this February day. Uh, it's a difficult time, and there is hope for the future. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we've been offering workshops in Toronto for many, many years with people like Ron Siegel. And now we're all webinars all the time. And what we're finding is that this Zoom um, content, this Zoom reality really can bring us together and connect us in ways that can be very, very helpful, especially with the isolation and the opportunity to, to meet and talk with very interesting people. Uh, our little commercial about what's coming up is we have a few programs in the next month having uh, related to mindfulness. Uh, next week, Valerie Mason John is doing something on interrupting the vicious cycle of toxic stories and traumatic activation. And she's an old meditator and a very interesting presenter. Mark Wernberg is presenting on dealing with pandemic anxiety. It's a new book she's just uh, come out with. And then we have Dr. Rich Fields on mindful behavioral relapse prevention. And then of course, Ron Siegel's three webinars, which you'll probably hear a little bit more about. If you haven't been with us before, this is how these programs work, whether they're paid or they're free. Emily is our producer. She's the hostess with the mostess. She, you might be seeing her. She's also my daughter, but she is great at what she does. She's there as your support and Ron's support as well. If you have questions for Ron, please put them in the chat line or just say, I'd like to ask a question. And Emily will be moderating that portion of our program, which will probably, the questions will probably start in about a half hour or so. If you have any technical problems, you'd also write Emily in that chat line. And as with everything we do, uh, this will, will be sent to you as a link uh, later today, most likely. So if you miss some of it or you want to listen to a question again, you'll have that uh, your, in your uh, inbox and you can watch it at any time. So I'm really kind of thrilled to in introduce you. If you don't know Ron Siegel, he's an assistant cl clinical professor of psychology at Harvard clinical Medical professor. School. He's taught where he's taught since the early 1990s. He's been a longtime student of mindfulness meditation and was really one of the people who brought the idea of, of mindfulness in psychotherapy to many professionals. His first book co-edited with Chris Germer, Mindfulness and Psychotherapy came out in 2005. Since then, he's written a few other books, The Mindfulness Solution, Wisdom and Compassion and Psychotherapy. And he's always been groundbreaking and ahead of his time. And here we are in 2021 talking about therapy and um, potential of psychedelics and what we can learn from all that's going on in, um, in the world of psychedelics and research and psychotherapy and helping people who often haven't been helped very much by other kinds of therapy. So Ron, welcome to our screen. It's very nice to have you here. Thank, thanks for having me. And I always start off with the, uh, on these lunches with why, with, with, with many wonderful people like you who are influenced in the therapy world of how you got interested in becoming uh, a psych psychologist, a psychotherapist. How did it start? Well, funny that we're, you asked that question in the context of talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, because it's probably, to tell you the truth, if I hadn't taken psychedelics when I was 17, I would probably be a mechanical engineer or something like that, because I grew up in a household that was um, led by a kind of rational positive positivist dad who was super interested in logic and the material world. And, you know, I spent my childhood disassembling toasters and the like and putting them back together. Um, but then I had this very unusual experience and, you know, I wasn't in any kind of vanguard in particular. I was growing up, you know, this is the, uh, uh, the late 1960s uh, in a suburb of New York and uh, people were experimenting with psychedelics and I did and I had a profoundly transformative experience back then where suddenly all of my various adolescent preoccupations about you know what's happening with my girlfriend and my you know getting into college and all of that started to not seem relevant and there seemed I, I felt part of this wider world and I had a perspective on on my preoccupations that was like nothing I had 
experienced before. And afterwards I got curious, you know, well, who knows about these states? Who, who in the world has, has investigated, you know, how without drugs one could have this kind of, of perspective. And uh, it was people in spiritual traditions, people uh, uh, who had done a lot of deep meditation practice. And I, I became interested in Buddhist traditions uh, from that. And uh, in fact, as an undergraduate, I majored basically in cross-cultural approaches to transpersonal experiences. We didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it was. It was looking at, at uh, how people through contemplative practices had had these experiences of transcending our normal, um, our normal narrative about ourselves into experiencing ourselves as interrelated with a wider world. And that was actually the backdrop for then becoming a psychologist. I was at a certain point in my life thinking, Zen monk or psychologist? I probably wouldn't have made it as a Zen monk, but I, but I was nonetheless thinking in those terms. And I thought, well, you know, I'll be a psychologist, it more fits me and my culture. But the way that I came to understand psychology was all influenced by this other uh, point of view and by really the psychotherapeutic systems, if you will, that existed within wisdom traditions. You know, when you say that, Ron, I think about many people have mentioned that someone who influenced me too was Ram Dass in that first book, Be Here Now. Um, that was kind of eye-opening for a lot of people. And I'm wondering if, if he or who are the other people who kind of opened your eyes or helped you see uh, the potential of this kind of thinking? Well, it, it was certainly Ram Dass and Ram Dass before he was Ram Dass, before Ram Dass was Ram Dass, when he was Richard Alpert, a psychologist at Harvard, <clears throat> he wrote a book with Timothy Leary and, Mal and Ralph Net Metzner called The Psychedelic Experience, which was a guidebook loosely modeled off of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I don't think they were, did a great job as, as, um, as anthropologists or, or, or you know, students of, of, uh, uh, of Buddhist traditions, but they created a kind of guide for how these substances might work psychotherapeutically and transformatively. And it was actually reading that that probably created some of the setup for that 17 year old experience to have been transformative in that way. And then after people like Ram Dass, I became very interested in, um, I, I sat a retreat, this is a few years later, but uh, when Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg opened the Insight Meditation Society uh, near me here in Barry, Massachusetts, and uh, I sat a retreat with them in my first year, and that that probably is what most accelerated uh, my uh, my interest and my my work in this. But in the meantime, I was reading, you know, the classical Zen authors, Philip Kaplow, and and the like, as you know, Zen flesh, Zen bones, Suzuki Roshi. Uh, all of those folks, while simultaneously on the psychology side, being more drawn to the nascent uh, humanistic psychology um, of the time. Okay, well, Ron, I wanna pivot and switch gears and go from now to the distant past and our evolutionary propensities from how we got to this place of where we are and how our hardwiring affects us and what we can learn from thinking about the effects of, 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 of who we were before? You know, my, my best sense out of, you know, having now had a rather long career as a psychologist is that we humans really did not evolve to be happy. Uh, rather, the brain evolved for survival. And any mechanism that helped to perpetuate our genes, the way natural selection works, those tended to persist. And the ones that didn't perpetuate our genes tended to fall out. And that left us with all sorts of natural instincts and reactions that aren't actually so helpful for our well-being right now. And they are the very instincts and reactions that meditative traditions, as well as uh, guided psychedelic experiences, tend to provide antidotes to. So some examples. We have a natural proclivity to avoid pain and seek pleasure. Makes perfect sense. That's going to lead us toward food and sex, keep us away from venomous snakes and the like. It's, it's, it's built into us, it's built into all organisms, it's even built into bacteria to go for the nutrients and move away from the toxins. But this tendency to do that, fast forward into modern human psychology, causes untold suffering because it causes all of the ways in which we try to avoid psychological pain. Basically, all of human defenses are about this 
this urge to avoid pain and seek pleasure. And we see obvious examples where it backfires for us. You know, let's take, uh, for example, uh, substance use problems, right? That uh, um, uh, let quick sh show of hands, those of you who are video, who have a video on, uh, how many of you, um, and let me encourage others to turn on their video if you're, if you're appropriately dressed so we can be a little interactive here. Um, raise your hand, physically raise your hand if you, uh, at least from time to time, uh, drink alcohol. Okay, many of us. Now, raise your hand if you do it exclusively, exclusively for the taste. Not so many of us, right? Because why do we drink alcohol? Because we have one state of mind, which is, you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's after a hard day at work and muscular skeletal, we look, we look something like this and we think, you know, a glass of wine would feel pretty good right now and would help us to relax. Or, you know, we're going to a party and they're gonna be before COVID and there are gonna be people there who we don't know or perhaps worse people there who we do know. And we think, you know, a drink would be a nice way to start this. We wanna change one state that's less pleasurable into a state that's more pleasurable. And doing this from time to time in moderation, not a problem. But if we do it compulsively, right, we have a substance use disorder or take anxiety. If I um, get anxious before public speaking or anxious before flying in airplanes, again, pre-COVID, but I do these things anyway, I don't have an anxiety disorder. But if I start to avoid public speaking or avoid flying in airplanes because I don't want to feel this discomfort, well, then I'm on the way to an anxiety disorder. And we could extend this out, but if we look at pretty much all of the things that afflict us as human beings, they all involve avoiding pain in some way, turning away from displeasure. Hardwired evolutionarily makes perfect sense, but in terms of modern management of our psyches, avoiding avoidance is a problem. It, it really, I'm, I'm sorry, avoidance is a problem and the solution is avoiding avoidance. What do we see in meditative traditions and frankly, the central uh, principle that we we're able to start deriving from psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, moving toward that which is difficult for us is ultimately a central mechanism in, in healing. I'll give you one other one, just uh, we could go on at some length, but, but I, I think it's, a, it's an important foundation. Our capacity for thinking, right? Marvelously helpful for our evolutionary history. It's really what allowed our ancestors to survive when, uh, when other species didn't do as well, right? We weren't particularly fast, we didn't have big teeth or claws, but we could strategize. We could imagine what the future is gonna bring, figure out how to you know, avoid that lion, hunt that gazelle. This capacity for thinking though causes us untold misery. Just take a moment right now, again, uh, you know, among us uh, here, think of something that disturbs you. Not, not the worst thing ever, but just something which is somewhat upsetting in your life. Here and now, sitting here on the Zoom call, in this moment, if it weren't for the thought of the thing, would you be having a problem? And the answer is usually, well, actually no. Here and now, I'm okay. Or even if it's pain here and now, physical pain, it's probably the thought that the pain is gonna get worse or be unremitting that's problematic. We can tolerate pretty high levels of pain if not accompanied by that kind of thought. And the entire realm of CBT obviously evolved out of this awareness that, oh yeah, it's our thoughts that create our problematic affects that create so much of our suffering. So let's just take just these two very simple, very basic elements of our evolutionary history to be thinking all the time. And in fact, what are we thinking about? How to have more pleasure and avoid pain. Uh, and this proclivity to avoid discomfort, these two factors create an awful lot of their basic um, building blocks of human psychological distress. And interestingly, much as I described the way that uh, meditative practices and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy tends to shift our relationship from experiential avoidance toward experiential approach, it also helps relativize thought. What both of these interventions do is they create profound metacognitive awareness, actually seeing thoughts as thoughts rather than believing in our narratives. And this becomes 
very freeing. And it's part of the whole movement that's now happened in modern CBT that has really moved away from how do we change maladaptive, irrational thoughts into adaptive, rational ones and move toward how do we gain perspective on thought generally? How do we learn to allow thoughts to come and go, but not identify with them and notice that they're contingent on mood? So those are just a couple of examples, I think, of sort of our history and how it, um, and how these uh, these other kinds of interventions that we're beginning to talk more about um, are actually antidotes to our hardwired propensity to be miserable. And the when mindfulness started to affect this the psychotherapy scene, it had quite a dramatic effect. Because I remember at one time when there are conferences of behavioral psychotherapists, they didn't want to have anything to do with mindfulness and they rejected people who wanted to present. And now if you go to a behavioral conference, well, you, when they happen again, an awful lot of the presentations are on mindfulness. I'd be interested, uh, your view as someone who helped introduce mindfulness to a lot of people, how you think psychotherapy and psychotherapists have changed over these years before we lead up to what the promise of psychedelic assistant therapy might be. Yeah, well, I think the influence of mindfulness uh, has kind of came together with, um, with another thread in uh, the evolution of psycho psychotherapy, which was toward a more constructivist view or a more contextualist view. You know, early in the days of psychotherapy, um, for example, psychodynamic psychotherapists thought that they were uncovering what really happened in childhood. And they were helping people to get out of their current narratives. And as a kind of, you know, Freud even described it as an archaeological dig. We'll find out what really happened once you can, excuse me, once you can embrace what really happened, then you won't be neurotic anymore. It's a gross oversimplification, but, but that's kind of what we were doing. And behaviorally, we were looking for rational, adaptive, Thinking. We weren't going to be caught in irrational thinking. We were going to be caught, we were going to move toward rational thinking, which was about, you know, being grounded in reality. And interestingly, as mindfulness practices and this, this whole movement toward both acceptance and moving toward experience, as well as more and more metacognitive awareness, in other words, identifying less with thought and taking thought less seriously, noticing that thought is, you know, so, you know, uh, let me just a uh, little tangent here. You know, there are two main findings that have happened in cognitive science over the last 20 years. One of them is the discovery that we are hopelessly irrational. You think, look at things like the implicit bias test that look at our prejudices. We are, we are simmering cauldrons of prejudices, of, of expectations. And as the cognitive scientists like to say, gee, if I wouldn't have believed it, I wouldn't have seen it because we can only see the stuff that we have a conceptual map that's, that's going to permit us to see these things. So we're this, and the other big finding is we all imagine ourselves to be rational actors. We all really think that our view is the correct one. And if you don't believe me about this or don't believe the cognitive scientists, just look at the political arena, which is basically a study in psychology with a very large N. And boy, do we ever believe in our narratives and do we ever believe that the other truth is diluted in their narratives? And it's, you know, it's, it's actually remarkably symmetrical. Um, between political parties around this. So, so given that thought is so irrational, mindfulness practices help us to start to just see it as coming and going and not identifying with it so much. As do these psychedelic experiences provide these, uh, these profound shifts in perspective, these profound shifts in point of view, which almost always parallel the kinds of shifts that come out of mindfulness practice. They just do it in an, in an accelerated, uh, way. So what, what happens to our traditional psychotherapies as they've been exposed more to the mindfulness practices, of course, historically, although I think this is going to accelerate as psychedelic assisted psychotherapies become more mainstream. What happens is, um, uh, you know, the psychodynamic theorists are much more interested in seeing different self states coming and going in narrative approaches to understanding um, you know, the stories we tell ourselves about the past, no longer doing an archeological dig, trying to get at the real past. And the behaviorists are much more interested in, um, in the quality of the narratives that we tell ourselves, rather than looking for the correct narrative versus the incorrect narrative. And in all of this has been infused a great deal of interest in 
uh, in compassion and self-compassion. You know, is there a way as we're exploring these things to do it with love and noticing, you know, as we see from, you know, Scott Miller's research on psychotherapy outcomes that frankly, what we think we're doing as therapists is much less important than the love relationship, than how connected we are to our patients or, or clients and how much they, you know, as my friend Dan Siegel likes to say, feel felt, how much they experience our, our presence in a loving and accepting way. So I think the field, ha, you know, continues to evolve in these ways that really parallel the, discover, the discoveries that come from mindfulness practice and also, and this is now quite cutting edge that we're seeing are coming from uh, psychedelic explorations. I'll follow that up with, you know, you talk about self-compassion and you've worked with Chris Germer for a long time and he's certainly very well known for his promotion and his ideas about self-compassion. And now you're both learning about the effects of psychedelic interventions in self-compassion. Can you kind of go through that progress from mindfulness and self-compassion to what psychedelic assistant therapy is telling us that might be helpful even if we're not providing psychedelic therapy, which most people can't do anyway? Sure. You know, mindfulness has always had as a component acceptance, right? You know, people define in different ways, but it's basically awareness of present experience with acceptance. But the quality of that acceptance is very important. Is it a kind of dry acceptance like, okay, I can let this happen? Or is it a kind of loving embrace of experience? Is it a kind of open heartedness? And in fact, in Buddhist traditions, mindfulness is probably more accurately translated as heartfulness, a kind of open hearted attitude toward whatever is arising in consciousness, as well as an open hearted attitude toward other people. And you know, if we if we step back and we look at the uh, the uh, the history of psychology, and particularly developmental psychology, and ask the question, what is the most robust predictor of psychological health generally? Most people would say, most researchers would say, well, it's a ideally secure but some form of organized attachment history. And what do we mean by that? We basically mean that that as a child, we somehow had the experience of being in distress and having some loving adult being able to approach us, hold us, transmit the Mr. Rogers message of it's okay, sweetheart. And that allowed us to regulate, that calmed us, that soothed us, that took care of us. And if we have that as an internalized experience, it becomes a great resource going through the rest of our life. It allows for resilience when we face all sorts of difficulty. If we didn't have them as in our developmental history, as we all know as clinicians, it's a much rougher road through life because we've all either ourselves had this experience or we've worked with clients or patients who did not have this and very painful. Fast forward to research and self-compassion. It turns out that much as secure attachment predicts kind of everything good in psychological development, you know, the quality of your relationships and the stability of them, your ability to work, freedom from anxiety and depression, et cetera, so does self-compassion. Chris's and my colleague, Kristen Neff, who's done a lot of research in self-compassion, developed scales for measuring it, found that the higher you are on self-compassion, the better you are, the better you come out on all these different psychological variables. So how could this be that hmm, secure attachment and self-compassion both seem to be predictive of everything good in psychological development? It's because they're the same thing. What we're talking about with self-compassion is when we're experiencing a moment of distress, being able to say to ourselves in some way, it's okay, sweetheart. Whether we say it overtly with self-talk or we simply feel that, that is a moment of self-compassion. Now this starts to dovetail with the, the outcomes that we see in, um, in psychotherapy research. What I said about Scott Miller's research that, oh, when clients or patients feel held by therapists, feel this sense of it's gonna be okay, I'm understood and I'm held, then they thrive in in psychotherapy. So it's really what's happened here historically is, Chris likes to say, warming up the conversation. But when we're doing our mindfulness practice, really infusing the mindfulness practice with consciously and deliberately with love, with this, with the sense of a warm embrace of whatever's coming up, whether it be a moment of joy, a moment of pain, re-experiencing a past trauma, not just accepting it in a dry way, 
but accepting it with, with a loving attitude. And this makes perfect sense because we're basically figuring out how do we create the experience of secure attachment in us now as adults? And mindfulness and self-compassion practices can do this. And the fascinating thing that we're seeing is that in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, people can have these profound and immediate experiences of it's okay and I'm okay. Not, not an opiate like I'm okay, not an anesthetized I'm okay, but oh, I see this from a greater perspective. I see this through a broader lens. I see how my life and my experience fits with others. I see that everyone is brokenhearted, for example. I notice that everybody has just a limitless set of injuries that we've experienced in, in our lives and almost everybody uh, to some degree push them out of awareness, crust it over, and we share this as humans. Those kinds of experiences start to become very, very liberating for people. So we see that, so what's, what's happening currently is really just building upon what we've known all along um, in psychotherapy, but it's also teaching us by highlighting, so what exactly are these transformative mechanisms. And the, the question, which I think is fascinating, which we'll be exploring when we do these webinars is, so how can we as clinicians, if we're not, we're not gonna be working with psychedelics for some time, probably 2023, the earliest for FDA approval, wide scale, like here it is therapists use it. Uh, how can we harness these insights to inform our psychotherapies currently. And I think there's a lot of ways to do it once we start to notice exactly what these insights are, what are the, what are the guiding principles and, and how do they work to, um, uh, to support emotional healing. So there are lessons about how we can create this holding environment that in the psychedelic assistant therapy that I've seen some videos where it's incredibly supportive, it's not like take psychedelics, go away, you'll feel better. It could be at all. With very experienced, caring, loving therapists, sometimes working with, I've seen soldiers who, who had been guilt-ridden, nightmare, trauma from all their experiences in war, start to accept themselves in that environment in ways they never could possibly believe in before. So what are the lessons therapists can, can learn about creating an environment that, that maybe create some of that. Exactly, and, and how do we pair the access to the material which has been pushed out of awareness because it's been too hard to face? How do we help turn people's attention toward this difficult material at the same time that we're basically evoking the inner experience of secure attachment, right? How, you know, to, to be doing these things um, simultaneously. And interestingly, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things from this is simply knowing about what's going on in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and sharing that with patients helps. Like I've had a lot of very interesting experiences of just telling patients about the studies, about how they're set up and about what tends to unfold for people and say, and this is what happens, you know, to people's trauma when they approach it in this way. And suddenly it provides a kind of map for them about, oh, so this is what I'm trying to do. You know, I mean, they may say, oh, how do I sign up for the study? You say, well, there's a 50,000 person waiting list. I don't think you're gonna be part of the study, but then they get interested in, so how are we gonna do this? Um, how might we do this in real time uh, here and now? And uh, it actually becomes inspirational because it allows, you know, among other things, it allows people to think this is possible, that I actually could grow through this. I actually could shift perspective radically enough to, um, to be able to be at peace with myself here. Um, I think I'd like you to ask, I'd like to ask you to define some terms because some people watching this, I'm sure are new to, to these ideas and there's a lot of words and, and drugs. So, so first MDMA, what is it? And what are we learning from it? Okay, so MDMA is a, um, uh, a synthesized molecule. It is an ingredient in the street drug ecstasy, but, um, but ecstasy as it's found as a street drug often contains all sorts of other elements that, um, uh, that are problematic. And MDMA is not a classic psychedelic, and we'll talk about classic psychedelics separately. MDMA is, people call it different things. It's kind of an empathogen. It, it basically 
creates a profound experience of Mr. Rogers inside. It, it creates this sense that it's okay, sweetheart. It's really okay, sweetheart. And people, when they feel that, they relax profoundly and suddenly they have access to all of the small and large T traumas of their life that have been pushed out of awareness because they no longer feel the impulse to defend because somehow the substance relaxes the impulse to defend and replaces it with a sense of um, feeling loved and held. Now, I, I, I wanna, let me make a caveat. This is all within the context of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, highly controlled circumstances where people are carefully chosen for their, um, uh, both their willingness to explore these realms and the absence of things like uh, psychotic disorders, major mental illness, things like this. There's a great deal of preparation and holding being done. There's a great deal, as, as Michael was pointing out, there's a great deal of holding done during the experience and there's a lot of attention played to later integration. I, I wanna just underscore really strongly, this is not about, hey, man, this drug's cool, take it and cure yourself. No, this is about using this in a highly structured way in an environment that's, that's going to be um, supportive. But within that environment, that seems to be how the substance the MDMA works. And MDMA is the furthest along. The um, MDMA is currently in phase three uh, studies. We all know about vaccines, what phase three studies are. That's when you use it with a large number of people and see what happens after you've already established safety and efficacy in your phase one and phase two studies. So we're already in phase three. And in fact, the FDA was so impressed by the efficacy of, F of MDMA for otherwise intractable PTSD that they opened it up into another, they did two things. One, they, they did the um, fast tracking of it, which basically means an accelerated review process. And the other thing they did was they said, uh, they opened it to compassionate use, which is they allowed a number of clinics around the country to do this work outside of the research protocol, just because it was so promising in the research protocol, let's give this to some veterans who are, who are who are struggling terribly. So that, that's basically the deal, um, a very encapsulated view of what's going on with MDMA. Okay. Um, when we talked about doing this series and which people and which drugs would be important to talk about. So ketamine is getting a lot of publicity because it was, uh, from my understanding, a drug that's been prescribed legally. And Phil Wolfson is one of the developers of ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So tell us about what ketamine is and maybe what Phil's contributed to, to our knowledge. Sure, so, so ketamine's a, you know, very interesting in that it has been used by anesthesiologists for a very long time as, uh, to as part of um, administering anesthesia. It's been used by emergency room docs as an analgesic, in other words, a, a very rapid and intense painkiller. And these are all at different doses. And at certain doses, it works as a psychedelic, close to a classical psychedelic in the sense of um, opening people's experience. Psychedelic literally means mind manifesting. So it, it, it's basically about opening people to um, contents that have been pushed out of awareness and opening people to seeing connections among things, as well as to this very often what happens in these experiences is something like a transpersonal experience where people experience something which they usually describe in spiritual terms of getting out of their sense of separate selfness and into a sense of interconnection with something larger. And ketamine at certain doses does this. Now, the interesting thing about ketamine is it's legally prescribable for these other purposes. And as many of you know, particularly those of you who are physicians or other prescribers, any prescriber can use a medicine off label, in other words, for something that it does not have FDA approval for, to treat something else if you have reason to believe that it may work. So there are quite a number of ketamine assisted psychotherapy centers that have opened worldwide because this is a legally prescribable drug because it has a very good safety profile, again, used within this context with you know physician monitoring and the like. Um, and uh, and can induce these states, so it can so uh, so there are people doing that currently. The interesting thing is that ketamine was discovered when 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 it was being used as an anesthetic. Um, some people who went into surgery who had been suffering from major depression came out of the surgery and weren't depressed. And this this 
this caught people's attention. Like, how come? I mean, the surgeons were asking, how come you're not depressed, right? So that developed this other, this whole other track, which is using ketamine as an antidepressant. <laughs> and there are, there are, there are many, many uh, clinics around in most of the major teaching hospitals have these in which they're not using it for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. An attractively depressed person comes in, they get a ketamine infusion and they feel better for a couple of weeks. And during the infusion, they say, read a book, watch TV. They're not doing any kind of exploration. There's no psychodynamic inquiry. Whereas when it's being done in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, it's all about let's use this to understand your heart and mind and shift your perspective on things. So Phil Wolfson, who edited the ketamine papers, he was one of the first people really collecting uh, information on this and has, he's a psychiatrist, he has legally guided countless people through these experiences and trained others. Um, he has many, many years experience now uh, of doing this and cataloging what happens. And, you know, just as a, as a quick uh, foreshadowing, I, you know, I had the chance, um, and they invited me and Phil was here in the Boston area. I'm, I'm in the Boston area here. Um, and they had a group of therapists who were in a training workshop. And part of the training workshop is having a ketamine experience. And I came in for the integration phase at the end. And I was to talk about the relationship between this and psychotherapy, between this and meditation and psychotherapy. And it was really fascinating to hear these therapists, many of whom were, were highly experienced therapists saying, you know, I had a sense of compassion toward my patients that I have never experienced in my whole life. It, I, suddenly I understood their suffering from the inside in a way that was just profoundly transformative. So, because, so these are just little highlights. It's, it's very interesting what's happening uh, in the, the, the ketamine work. Like how's it working as an antidepressant, but also what's its potential in terms of uh, using it to, um, to guide people toward insight. Okay, one more and then we'll open up to questions. So psilocybin and Anthony Bosis. Okay, so psilocybin is a classical psychedelic. Most people know it as the, uh, the key ingredient in um, magic mushrooms, right? It's been used uh, as, a, um, as a ritual um, religious investigatory plant for millennia. Um, and uh, it, um, so as a classical psychedelic, what it does is it, it makes gives access again to elements of experience that have been pushed out of awareness, shifts people out of their conventional thought stream into being part of this kind of flow of experience. And very often gives people again, the sense of profound interconnection with the wider world. And Anthony Bosis, who's a, who's a psychologist at NYU, um, has been studying this in the context of end of life care, uh, particularly with patients uh, suffering from cancer. He also has another study that he can't talk about the, the findings of yet, but it's a fascinating study where they're using psilocybin with religious leaders, people who spent their whole life as clergy and seeing whether the effect on their contemplative practices of these substances. And, you know, as a, um, to guess what's going to happen, there were some wonderful studies in Switzerland where they took uh, Zen meditators who were on a session, which is a, a five day uh, silent retreat, and they gave them psilocybin at day four. And the vast majority of them said, now I understand what Zen is about. Now I have a sense of what the Buddha meant. They, they had these profound senses of, oh, this is what I've been working toward, but I hadn't, I didn't get, I didn't get experientially what these teachings were about, now I get it experientially. Anyway, with the cancer survivors, or the cancer, I shouldn't say survivors, some have passed away, but the, the um, uh, people suffering from cancer, uh, they found profound decreases in anxiety and depression um, at, in, in terms of dealing with the illness. And the, the fascinating thing they found was the degree to which the person had a transpersonal or mystical experience was the predictive factor of symptom reduction that what alleviated the symptoms was this shift of perspective into like, fun, like getting it that I'm not this isolated finite self, but I'm part of some larger 
universe. Uh, to me, it was hilarious reading that I was following this work, reading it as it's being published in mainstream psychiatric journals, because the commentators who weren't really familiar with these substances in this work, which were writing about it as though the psilocybin had a six month half-life or something. Six months later, they're still transformed after one dose. No, it's not the medicine that's effect that's in their body for six months. They've had an experience of insight and that insight has lasted. And Tony's got research going back. I think he's four years out from some of these studies. He published his first one, 2016, showing for the people who have managed to survive physically, it's lasted for many of them. That, they're, that, that this, this one experience back then created a, a shift in view, which is somehow maintaining. And like, that's a fascinating challenge for us as psychotherapists, right? How can we help our, our patients to have these kinds of profound shifts of view and even to know what we might be heading toward, what we might want to be heading toward? To, to just briefly sum up, I think for most of us as, as therapists, the, you know, what we can learn at the moment from the psychedelic assisted work is a beacon where we wanna to go toward. And I'll finish with this thought, you know, I had a, um, a conversation, I'll, I'll predict her, um, her anonymity, but with somebody who was very tied in with the whole crowd of people who brought Buddhist practices to, uh, to the West. Um, um, you know, you, you would know their names, the, the, the folks who, you know, many, many people read um, about these things who have started programs, who've done all this kind of stuff, started meditation centers. And I was asking her, so what percentage of them because you know them, she's a, a little bit of a 10 years older than me, so she's hanging out with these folks. Um, what percentage of them got interested in these meditative practices because they had a psychedelic experience? She said, she was thinking through them all, she said, I think all, the, all of them that I know, I think all of them that I know had one of these experiences and it formed, it was a kind of kindling experience that said, oh, this kind of, shift in consciousness might be possible. So how do I build it into my life? And then they became meditators and often meditators, teachers, people who started programs, all this kind of thing. So it's very interesting to see this coming full circle now and seeing this coming back into um, what, what may be a mainstream element in psychotherapy a few years from now. Well, wow. also interesting, because of our time, I'd like to open it up for questions. Emily's going to be our moderator. We're not going to have time for a lot of them, but we'll hopefully take a few. And uh, Emily. Great. Okay. So we have a lot of questions. So I apologize to everyone in advance if we don't get to all of them. Um, but Pete, Pete was our first question. Pete, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Howdy, Ron and everyone. Howdy. Um question for you. Um, I have heard, I've read, and I've heard from folks who've tried uh, class the psychedelic psilocybin about microdosing. Um, and a question I have is sort of, what is it? Um, what it, is there? Is there a common understanding of what that means? Um, and is there any advice that you would give to a client about microdosing? I mean, from a professional perspective, is there, I, I was kind of scratching my head, what do I, what do I say? you know, that, that we could say is a safe way to do this or not? Yeah, now I feel, I, I'm a psychologist by profession. I have a license and I am not going to advise any client to take any psychedelic substances outside of an FDA approved study or ketamine assisted psychotherapy with a colleague that I trust. So that's, personally, that's how I would approach this because um, uh, even though these substances are, um, decriminalized now in an increasing number of locations. Um, uh, you know, we simply don't have data on this in the, in the wild and people can get into trouble. All of that said, uh, you know, microdosing is about taking a small enough dose so that all executive functions are preserved. Uh, it's taking a dose so that you can still remember your zip or postal code, depending on the country you're living in. Uh, you could still, um, uh, carry on a perfectly good conversation with somebody about any matters. Um, but having a little bit of this sort of perspective shifting that comes, and people do indeed report that, you know, they, they experience more sanity with this. It, and, and I'm defining sanity as more presence in the, more ability to be present in the here and now, 
more open-heartedness, more ability to connect to others, uh, less preoccupation with the, the usual kind of neurotic self-talk that preoccupies us, basically less self-preoccupation. That's another, I, I didn't even get, uh, we can look at this from, from another lens. One of the other things this whole thing is pointing toward both the meditative traditions and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is what we should be doing as therapists is helping people to be less self-preoccupied is helping people to be less concerned with self-evaluation, with how they're doing, with um, traditional measures of success, and much more interested in connection. Because uh, that's the other, the other finding that's coming out of this. Microdosing seems to move people in these directions. But as a professional, I, um, I would urge caution. Because yeah. you know, and anything that's strong enough to be able to be useful is strong enough to create problems, fire being an obvious example of that. And, uh, you know, psychedelics can create big problems when used, um, uh, when not used in a thoughtful, controlled, safe way. So, um, so I tend not to advise people about this in the wild. Although I will say one of the things that happens that this whole investigation of, you know, how can we clinicians use knowledge about this is we are increasingly going to have clients and patients who are doing this stuff and to at least be knowledgeable about it and to be able to say, look, I'm not going to advise you either way, but you might consider this, you might consider this risk, you might consider, you know, it, the more we can intelligently know this turf, the more we can have intelligent conversations with our clients about it, even if we are not directing them one way or another. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next is Sunil. Sunil, did you want to unmute? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Already? Great. Yeah, Hi. whenever you're ready. Uh, Dr. Spiegel? Hi. Uh, I had a eureka moment when you mentioned the word love <clears throat> and its application in medical care. I'm a neurologist and interventional pain specialist. <clears throat> So I had this eureka moment when you mentioned the use and uh, sorry, the benefit of love with inpatient care, that love is more beneficial. I, I realized that love is more beneficial than anything else we do. And I have had that personal experience in my 30 years of practice. But when you mentioned <laughs> I had a eureka moment, so can you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, you know, uh, psychotherapists and healthcare practitioners generally are shy about the word love for a good reason, because love very easily can have either erotic connotations or possessive attachment connotations. And those forms of love are not helpful, you know, in the, in the, in the healthcare professional relationship. But the forms of love that are closer to what we, what the Greeks would call agape, or the forms of love that are more about uh, brother or sisterhood, um, and the forms of love that are about celebrating our common humanity, and the fact that we are all struggling human beings going through this life cycle, and you know, there's good fortune and bad fortune and, and nice moments and painful moments, and there's a lot of painful moments even when we're having good fortune. That kind of love is enormously, enormously curative. And, and that is one of the things that we see from meditative traditions. We see from the, you know, the, this um, greater conscious inclu uh, inclusion of self-compassion in contemplative practices, which is really about infusing these, these other non-erotic, non-attaching forms of love into the process. And it's what we're seeing in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. You know, uh, Mary Castellano, I, I think that's how you pronounce her last name, Mary, forgive me if I have it wrong, um, is uh, she's somebody who's been guiding these, these sessions at Johns Hopkins for literally, she was involved in the early movement before it got shut down in the 1970s. And she's been involved from the onset at Hopkins and Hopkins now has a $17 million grant for psychedelic assisted, uh, psychedelic studies now. And she's been guiding lots and lots of these things in the research. And she says, you know, I know it makes it sound like I'm, I'm simple-minded and not very sophisticated, but mostly what I do in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is try to love the subject. I just try to be there and love them. And you know, you, you hear more and more therapists saying this out of this work. And I know it, it you know, it, it it can seem like, oh, well, this is happy and overly simplistic and and uh, missing all the sophisticated complexity of 
of uh, psychotherapeutic interventions, but this may be a guiding principle that if we lose sight of it, um, we do so at, at the, our own peril and the peril of our, our clients or patients. A better term would be empathy and compassion uh, instead of love, which is what I have been doing for 30 years and it's not done by MDs and therefore <laughs> MDs group of members. <laughs> But I think, I think using the word love warms it up even more. Because yeah. uh, at least for me, when I hear the word love, I kind of feel something in here. When I hear empathy or compassion, yeah, I feel that uh, not as much. Not as much. I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. We say, we say to our beloved, I love you, as opposed to, I feel compassionately toward you. Even, <laughs> yeah. though, even though the two are closely related. <laughs> love you. is far deeper than compassion and empathy, I yeah. agree. Well, it ha it, it, it's really about acknowledging the heart element of this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next we have, is it Charles Lee? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Oh, you've got it. You've got it right. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Siegel, thank you so much. Um, very, um, very great uh, presentation. And um, kind of dovetails, I'm reading a book by Brian Murescu called The Immortality Key about, um, you know, potential psychedelic use in, in Christian, in early, in early uh, paleo-Christianity. And um, also your, um, the, the work also reminds me of a lot of the work that I, I read that like Timothy Leary and, and um, Ram Dass, I forget his, his birth name, um, were doing in the, yeah, we're doing in the uh, in the Boston area and got got into uh, some trouble. With, well, they well but, they were. I mean, they they were doing this work, and they were they were, to my mind, retrospectively, a little overly enthusiastic mm -hmm. and not sufficiently restrained and constrained by let's think about safety, let's think about doing this systematically, and let's really study what we're doing here. Let's mm -hmm. really see you know, how this works for different people, rather than just go from our personal experience of something profound happening and assuming that this is somehow gonna be helpful for everybody else. Yeah, so my, my question is about the, um, I guess, uh, and I think you've reflected a lot on this, uh, the, the dangers uh, or some of the potential dangers of psychedelic assisted therapy. It seems like, uh, um, you know, my first response, it seems like a shortcut because, uh, you know, I've med been meditating for quite a while and I have some personal experience with psychedelics in my youth. And um, so I, I guess, I don't know if I had that insight then and that's, what, that's what's led me here, but I feel like I can access some of those states of insight with, um, you know, with, with, with meditation and mindfulness practices. So I guess I get, I get concerned. I guess I wonder, is there a difference in response in terms of ages of, of patients? I mean, obviously I don't think this has been you know, at all studied in, in, in children, but, um, but are we, you know, 18 year olds, young adults who are, you know, still developing uh, a frontal lobe um, versus middle-aged adults versus, you know, end of life people? Um, are there these, differential these are, these are dangers? All, these are all great questions. And, and I really appreciate you bringing up the danger part and re-emphasizing that because it is easy for people to have, people get very enthusiastic about this if they have experiences that feel transformational. And, um, you know, Jack Cornfield, who was uh, my teacher and now I consider a friend many years later, um, you know, he, he wrote a book where the title, uh, the book was good, but the title is like sublime. After the ecstasy, the laundry. And it was about meditative paths and about, you know, cause in intensive retreat practice, um, people frequently encounter states that are not dissimilar from some of these states that happen with guided psychedelic um, practices. Uh, these states of, of sublime oneness, appreciation of the moment, deep gratitude, open heartedness, these kinds of states. And the natural impulse is, how do I live this way all the time? Well, that's not so easy, right? That's not so easy at all. The, the work of integration and the work of slowly, slowly becoming less self-preoccupied, slowly, slowly becoming less, you know, consumed with all of our self-evaluative stuff, slowly, slowly opening to the suffering of the world. You know, those are, these are, these are life journey um, tasks. And this can be a shortcut. What's very interesting about the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is that for so many things, 
if we can, if we can see a path and it feels real and alive to us, it gives us a kind of hope, enthusiasm, and motivation that allows us to do other work, which is difficult. To my mind, that's some of what's happening with the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Like people who've been just stuck in depression see the possibility of a whole other way of looking at their life and their world. Now, you know, is that one session going to, and, and it lasts, you know, to a fair degree, but we also have to do th other things to cultivate this um, in, in our lives. And, and it is very exactly you, your point, you know, this idea of, hey, I want the quick, uh, you know, I want the quick cure. Well, you know, we want to respect that this can be useful, but also recognize that most psychological or spiritual transformation and growth uh, occurs gradually over a lifetime. And that, that uh, we want to use these somehow to support that larger project um, and to be very cautious about the, oh, I'm going to do this and it's going to solve everything because that, that's not actually how this stuff works. But it may be a very useful tool nonetheless. And, and some of these studies are suggesting it's a pretty useful tool. You know, people that otherwise have not been, otherwise have been really, really stuck with intractable um, psychological distress are, are shifting. So that's, that's also important. Thank you. Um, we, I think we have time for one last question from Rilla. Rilla, are you there? I am. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Yeah. Hi Dr. Siegel. Hi. Um, I'm very curious as a, as a practitioner of both um, holotropic breath work and guided imagery and music, both of which came out of the LSD trials, um, how these newer drugs um, uh, provide different experiences or amplify that kind of experience, which is very integrated end to end with a client. Yeah, I, I think, well, psilocybin isn't particularly newer because you know, it, it, it really predates LSD because it was yeah. living in mushrooms for a long time and a lot of indigenous groups were using that. Um, and it's, it's fairly similar to LSD uh, in its effects, just, you know, how, how long it lasts is different, um, um, but it, it's, it's fairly similar in, in its effects. You know, MDMA has a, really has this different effect of being an empathogen of, of, of not creating the same profound shifts in perspective, but being very heart opening um, to people. So that is a somewhat different kettle of fish. And uh, we'll hear from, from Phil Wolfson a little bit more about ketamine. My sense is it's not that different from what happens with the classical psychedelics uh, like LSD and, and psilocybin, but he has much more experience with this and could, um, uh, you know, could talk about it uh, in some depth. It seems that it's going in a similar direction that way, but things like holotropic breath work are also going in the same direction. So um, the, uh, I think what's important for us here is to see what the various parallels are and divergences are about these different methods. Um, we have another conference coming up. I don't want to say something that competes with what we're, the stuff we're doing with Le Leading Edge, but in May, we're having a Harvard conference on non-ordinary states and psychotherapy, which is you know, a very kind of broad umbrella of all this stuff. And um, uh, I think developing a differentiated map of how these different non-ordinary states relate to one another is, um, is our ongoing work. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think we have time for one last question and Todd's next on the list. Uh, Todd, did you want to unmute? Hi, uh, Todd. Yeah, I'm there. And I see Dr. Siegel. Um, my question was around, I mean, I think the, you know, the obvious breakthrough here with the psychedelics is that opportunity um, for the awareness around the connectedness. So do you want to speak briefly to how 5-MeO-DMT being a disassociative seems to be having the same, same type of breakthrough opportunities? Yeah, you know, here again, this is part of this more differentiated map because that's, that's another, um, that's, uh, um, if, if I, my memory serves me right, that's the uh, toad licking uh, psychedelic originally that was, it was found on toads and has been, um, uh, has been synthesized now in the lab mm -hmm. um, and uh, is a very short acting psychedelic, which raises the really interesting prospect. This isn't being done in controlled studies yet, but what about like, you know, 
a 50 minute or maybe an hour and a half psychotherapy session instead of an eight hour long psychotherapy session that has in the midst one of these profound transpersonal experiences. And I think that remains to be seen. It's, um, it's highly disassociative. I mean, so right. my, my work so far with, with these other drugs is there's sort of a metacognition of the capacity to connect or the awareness of connectedness. But with the disassociative experience, we don't really have that concurrent metacognitive process. So yeah, I'm well, I think I think this is the whole. Yeah, there's all sorts of questions here. You know, these states that people enter into. Some people experience them as I've entered a whole different world, like literally, like uh, you know, a spirit world, or I've entered a whole different world. Other people interpret these experiences as, no, I got in touch with this unconscious realm that I hadn't experienced before. And the whole question of dissociation, so it's an, another fascinating topic because dissociation implies that there is normally a self there that we dissociate from. And one might argue from a Buddhist meditative perspective, for example, that if you look carefully, you won't find a self there. You only find a flow of experience. So the fact that these medicines flip people into a flow of experience is simply seeing the nature of consciousness more clearly than we see the rest of the time. So, the, uh, so this gets into a whole other fascinating realm, which is all sorts of psychiatric terms like depersonalization, derealization, dissociation. What exactly are these if we no longer believe that there is this thing called a coherent separate self that we are the rest of the time? Because all of these investigative methods show us that no, there is not one coherent self here. There's, you know, at best multiple self states and in constant interchange with one another and probably more like there's a continuous flow of experience utterly changing with no central organizing principle. So the, these are these are a little esoteric, these questions, but they're great questions that that I think are worthy of, of you know investigating over time, both through contemplative practices and and these psychedelic experiences. Well Ron, I want to thank you. These are and I'm apologizing to so many people who have questions. I mean this is a new area. There's a lot of interest in it and we're I'm so glad that you as a pioneer in so many ways could join us today and would be involved in our, our next three programs. And thank you all for watching. We will keep you informed as we continue our exploration of, of this theme and other themes that we consider on the leading edge. Uh, we normally open up the microphones for a mass goodbye, but I think we just have too many people in the room. It'll just be too noisy. Uh, that's what we normally do. So I'll say on behalf of everyone, we can wave our goodbyes and thank you for being here and hope to see you again. Thank you, Emily. Thanks thank you so everyone. much. And thank you so much, Emily and Michael, for organizing this as well as the, the webinar series. I'm really interested. I'm really looking forward to dialoguing with and learning from uh, my colleagues who are going to be part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you.